Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks uh, for being flexible and for uh, joining here today on Zoom. Um, yeah, um, feel free to interrupt me anytime uh, you have something to ask or comment. Um, yeah, and um, if you would rather write on ch in chat, I will try to see it. But um, yeah, I have a few screens here to, to navigate, so I would rather you to just pick up. Um, are there any other questions you might have before we get started? I know there is something about the homework that hasn't been addressed yet in Piazza, and I will check that after after the lecture. I didn't quite get what's going on um, from a first glance. Um, are there any other questions? Okay, uh, then let's uh, let's get started with our uh, new topic. Um, and just a brief reminder of what we have been talking about so far. We have um, in all of the lectures so far, these two uh, components of our modeling. We have our uh, uh, first step of producing some kind of representation of our text, which involves splitting text into smaller units. And last time we heard that <laughs> Having subwords is going to be the most useful for us. And then uh, we are going to use that list of split uh, text and produce some kind of representation out of it. Um, I keep um, today when I when I was preparing for this lecture, because uh, we, were, we are going to talk about vector semantics, I realized that I, I have um, uh, men kept mentioning that we are going to produce vectors. And indeed, in current NLP, you are always going to start with the vector. Um, that said, if you look at how the perceptron is implemented, you don't really need to keep it in a vector uh, because what you are doing is this uh, product between the weight and the corresponding feature. Uh, so you could go away with using other kinds of representations uh, in the algorithms we have uh, uh, you know, been using so far, but I really recommend you to keep thinking about these first, uh, you know, representations we are going to feed into our models as vectors, because eventually uh, that's uh, going to be um, what we are, uh, will be using. So, um, and um, after we have representation of our input, uh, we then want to learn a function that will map that input into, into the output. And so far, we have been talking only about cases where the output is a binary label, either positive or negative sentiment, for example. Um, and the two examples we have seen are perceptron and logistic regression. So what we are going to talk about today is we are still going to focus like the last time on this first part where we find a good representation of our input. And uh, we are going to uh, talk about uh, vector semantics and uh, embeddings uh, and so on, which probably doesn't mean anything right now because you might have be heard, you might be hearing about these terms for the first time. Okay, so um, why why are we going to talk about further about uh, representations? What's wrong with our representations we have seen so far, which is counting how many times tokens in the vocabulary have occurred or just recording their presence and absence as a binary value. Um, what, what's wrong with that? Well, the first thing that is going to be um, a, not, not necessarily wrong, but uh, it might bottleneck us is that we are doing the feature engineering, meaning we are creating these representations by hand. We are deciding by hand what kind of um, features of our input text are important for solving the problem. Uh, here I show, I'm show i showing you a, a screenshot from my very first paper in the 2016, where we were doing some kind of a task where we decided, okay, we need all these kinds of features to solve this task. Um, on the other hand, uh, an alternative to, to that is to do representation learning, uh, which is automatically learning useful representations of input text. Uh, and I have tried to emphasize the word automatically because indeed you are not uh, imposing what you think as a designer of your model should be useful, rather the, the creation of important features uh, is created in an automatic way. 
And representation learning is, is a whole field. Uh, there is like a workshop on representation learning. And very often these feature vectors will be learned. If you learn them automatically, they will be referred to representation. So this word, this uh, representation is a very technical term. If someone says, what is a representation of this text? What they mean is how are you um, turning your string into something like a vector? And what we want when we do representation learning, we want a model of word meaning uh, that allow us to draw inferences to address meaning-related tasks like question answering or dialogue. Um, so what that could be, uh, let's let's go over some aspects of word meaning that our uh, representations, our embeddings uh, we are, that we are going to introduce soon should capture or allow us to kind of poke into. Um, here you have a screenshot from a website Victionary. Uh, I have look, looked up a word basin. And uh, here, like any dictionary, you will have basin, like a lemma, uh, meaning the canonical form or dictionary form or citation form of a set of word forms. And uh, if the word has multiple meanings, then you will have a list of all these meanings. So basin can refer to a very wide bowl for washing, synonymous to a sink, uh, but it can also um, refer to certain uh, geographical formations that we all know since they occur here uh, in Utah. So all of these five meanings, we call them word senses. They are meanings of these uh, words. And, um, this is an example of a word that has multiple uh, senses. And that's gonna be, um, present a technical challenge because um, uh, for example, with our absence or presence kind of, of, uh, of um, presenting text, if we just had a word uh, basil, um, basil maybe in a, uh, together with some word that corresponds to different meanings, uh, we would still represent the word basin with absence or presence, although this word might have different meanings in these two contexts. And therefore, there is a task in NLP called word sense uh, disambiguation. We don't want to talk about word sense disambiguation, but I want you to be aware that that task exists and it's a legit task. Okay, are there any questions about these terms so far? Lemma, word senses representations, representation learning, feature engineering. All right. Um, okay, so uh, we have learned that words have senses and that they might have multiple senses, multiple meanings. And uh, you probably know what synonyms are. You know, when we write very often, we don't want to overuse a single word. So we're looking up, you know, searching on Google for other ways of expressing the same idea. Um, more formally, there are two ways we can define um, synonyms in NLP. We can say that two senses of two words are synonyms. When one word has a sense whose meaning is nearly identical to a sense of another word. So for example, canyons and gorgeous, these are two different words, uh, but their senses uh, you know, uh, are, uh, are the same. And we can also say that uh, more formally, that two words are synonymous if they are substitutable for one another in any sentence with a change uh, to, uh, without changing the truth conditions of the sentence. And these are the situations in uh, which the sentence would be true. A more, I would say, simple way of saying this would be that synonyms have the same meaning in some or all uh, contexts. Okay. Um, here I have said something uh, nearly identical. Um, I want to point you to this uh, linguistic principle, principle of contrast, which says that the difference in linguistic form is always associated with some difference in meaning. And um, one example you, you will find in uh, Jurovsky and Martin, I'm yet to put uh, the readings in the, in the document, apologies for being a little bit late on that, but H2O and water have the same meaning, um, but you will use, it would be strange uh, to see, you know, H2O in a surfing guide. Like um, you, you won't see like, you know, 
take your surfboard and uh, jump into H2O. That would be very weird. So despite these two things having the same meaning, they are still used uh, differently. And that's what people, uh, uh, these linguists are saying when they say, well, you know, there is always some difference uh, in the in the meaning. So nearly identical is what we are at. All right. Any any questions about synonyms? I, I'm pretty, I'm sure that you all are aware already what synonyms are. Okay. And and just have in mind that you know when um uh, when we have synonyms like canyons and gorges. Uh, let's say imagine one text that had, you know, the author had decided I'm going to use the word canyons and there is another author talking about the same thing, maybe let's say Zion National Park, but they decided they're going to use gorge. Um, under our previous feature vectors, uh, we would put presence for canyons and presence for gorges and zeros um, otherwise if they are absent. And these two texts, although they are talking about the same thing, might be seemingly very, very different because we didn't, under this feature vector model, um, consider at all that these two words actually have the same meaning. So the kind of feature vectors we have seen before are actually very limited in modeling synonyms. All right, so um, we, we now talked a little bit about this uh, principle of contrast, and this brings us to word similarity. Um, these are words that are not strictly synonyms, but they share some elements of meanings. So for example, belief and impression, or even skiing and snowboarding, although they are obviously referring to completely, you know, to, to different activities, there is uh, a lot that is also shared with uh, skiing and snowboarding. It's, it's like an activity you are doing during the winter and, uh, you know, uh, you need same kind of clothing to do this activity and stuff like uh, that. So word similarity is important because how similar two words are gonna is gonna help us also determine how similar the meaning of two sentences or larger body of text are. And that's gonna be helpful for many of the NLP uh, applications like question answering, for example, or dialogue that we keep mentioning. And then, um, Slightly different is word relatedness, where uh, which is also known as word association in psychology. So, for example, here you have coffee and cup, although they are they are completely have completely different meanings. You can imagine drinking your coffee from a cup, so they are in some sense related, or in a similar way. A surgeon uses a scalpel, so again, they are kind of uh, topically related. And more formal, formally, we would say that words are related if they belong to the same semantic field, which means that they cover a particular semantic domain and bear structural relations with each other, such as surgeon is using scalpel. Uh, the surgeon is the agent of uh, the action uh, where the, uh, you know, the tool that we use in that action is scalpel. So examples are like a hospital, we have surgeon, scalpel, nurse, anesthetic, hospital, or restaurants having waiter, menu, plate, food. Okay, so we also want a model that can, you know, uh, that can tell us, okay, these words are synonyms, these words are um, similar, and these words are related. We want a model to be able to capture that. And we also want a model that's uh, that captures the word, you know, our word meaning model to capture antonyms, which are senses that are opposite with respect to only one feature of meaning. Uh, for example, antonyms can define a binary opposition or be at the opposite ends of a scale, such as hot or cold, and be reverses, such as ascend or uh, descend. Um, similar to synonyms, I'm pretty sure you have used antonyms uh, in some context of your previous writing before, so I don't think that uh, needs to be um, you know, emphasized. But if we have two texts and one is talking about, you know, very hot weather and, uh, you know, maybe going to a beach and then you have another um, another document talking about, I don't know, expedition in, on glaciers when cold weather, you want a model that understands that these are uh, topics that are at the opposite end of the spectrum. 
All right, so these are some aspects of meaning we want to capture. And I just want you to realize that with the types of features and feature vectors we have capturing before are lacking in uh, capturing all of these aspects of meaning that we deem important to really understand uh, the meaning of a bigger piece of text, which is then important for actually building applications atop of, you know, full Wikipedia article, uh, let's say. Any questions about this so far? <laughs> okay, um, just have in mind that these are terms you should be aware of, you should know. If someone says uh, this is an antonym, synonym, um, word similarity, relatedness, you should have, um, you know, you should you you should know what what these terms are. Okay, so now let's let's uh, move on to um, a piece, a linguistic piece that we'll use to build uh, these kinds of uh, representations, um, and this linguistic insight we are going to use is called distributional hypothesis. And I will try to um, um, explain it with um, an example. So can I get a raise of hand by uh, everyone who knows what Arte Artemia is? Uh, and you can do that by finding these floating controls. And I think there will be raise a hand option. I don't expect many hands, so it's okay if I don't see any. Okay, I don't see any. So I'm assuming you guys don't know uh, what this is, which is good. That was intention behind this uh, example. Um, however, um, you might not know what this word is, but if I show you these examples, you might start, uh, you know, building idea of what this word might be. So if I tell you that you can uh, place this word in each one of these uh, blanks and you will have a valid uh, sentence, you will start to get a sense of what this word refers to. So, for example, a cluster of Artemia is floating in the lake. Biology studying the adaption of Artemia in saline environments. The population of Artemia fluctuates with the salinity of the water. You can observe Artemia in the shallows of the Great Salt Lake. And I might even go ahead and tell you, well, other words that can appear in this contents are algae, microorganisms, or shrimps. And although you don't know what this word exactly is, you now knowing that these other words can appear in this context as well, might conclude that, okay, Artemia is a simple form of life found in aquatic environments like the Great Salt Lake, similar to these uh, other organisms, like algae, microorganisms, and shrimps. And indeed, uh, this, uh, this uh, Artemia is a, is a type of shrimp you can find in the, uh, our salt lake. So what, what I try to illustrate here is this distributional hypothesis mega important term that says that words that occur in similar contexts tend to have similar meanings. So uh, those words we have seen before, algae, microsms, shrimps, artemia, they may appear in similar contexts and to some extent they, all, they have uh, similar meanings as words. Questions about that? This is very important. So. Uh, when someone tells distributional hypothesis, you should know, yes, that's a hypothesis that word, when words occur in similar context, then they tend to have similar meanings. Um, and this, this hypothesis is what um, is kind of the foundation of the vector semantics. Uh, vector semantics realizes this distributional hypothesis by learning vector representations of the meanings of the words directly from the distributions in text. So we vector semantics is going to produce a vector and each vector um, of a given uh, is for a given word, this vector will be close in this vector space to vectors of words uh, that have that appear in similar contexts. 
I also wanted to mention that lexical semantics is the linguistic studies of word meaning. So all of these things we are talking about this uh, today, all of these properties I mentioned before are something in, uh, we would study in linguistics under lexical semantics. Vector semantics is what I have said before. In general, semantics deals with meaning and there are many other subfields of semantics. I don't wanna go over all of them right now. Just remember there is uh, lexical semantics and vector semantics. Okay, there is a question. Uh, so the representation that we are training captures the contextual meaning of the word or the absolute meaning of the word. Okay, so I suppose that Harshit has heard that there are contextual word representations. That's something we are gonna mention uh, later on. I don't wanna confuse everyone because that's a few steps ahead. Uh, right now, uh, the meaning of the word we are talking about and the vector representation is depends only on that word, not where that word, if I give you a sentence uh, where that word appears like a basin before, and then another sentence uh, where that word appears, um, you will represent this word uh, with the same representation, with the same static representation. And later on, later in the lectures, we are gonna learn about vector representations uh, where we will change representation of a word depending on the exact sentence it's gonna appear in and therefore it's gonna be contextualized. But for now we are talking about for every word, we have just a single uh, static vector. And these kinds of uh, vector representations when they are learned from the text, um, we often refer to them as uh, embeddings. In mathematics, embedding is a mapping from one space or structure to another. Um, so that's um, also where the term uh, originates. But it grew out of the model called the latent semantic innocent model, uh, which is recast as LSA, uh, which I'm gonna mention uh, again in the next slide. Um, another way to think about, about like where, why this, why this term is that each discrete, discrete token is embedded in a continuous vector space. And it's what's important is when we refer to embeddings, we are referring to very short vectors relative to vectors of the size of the number of tokens in vocabulary, which would be, let's say, 30,000. Instead, with embeddings, we work with like 50 or at most 1,000 uh, dimensional vectors, so way shorter than the number of tokens we have in the vocabulary. And they're dense, meaning that there are no zeros in these vectors, unlike with um, feature vectors of the size of the size of the number of words uh, in the vocabulary, where you record presence or absence of a token, where you are going to have a lot of zeros. Those are types of vectors we call sparse vectors. And this density has empirically shown uh, to be uh, improving a lot of these uh, modeling approaches. Okay, so this is what we are at today. We are at uh, trying to see how can we learn uh, vector representation, meaning how can we find values into in those vectors automatically from a big corpus alone. And we are going to use distributional hypothesis that is linguistic observations that words occur in similar contexts to have similar meanings to, to make uh, that possible, that learning of those numbers in those vectors. Okay, i um, gonna stop for a second and see whether there are any questions. All right, there is a question that says, previously we have implemented feature ve vectors which basically record their either presence or counts of a word. Here, are we associating vector representation with every single word? Wouldn't that be computationally expensive? Yes, we are going to, for every single word, have a vector associated with it. Let's say a 300 dimensional uh, vector. Um, in what sense are you thinking this could be computationally expensive? Uh, because in the end, we can represent a sentence by let's say averaging those vectors. So in the end, you will still have a 300 dimensional vectors, unlike with the previous technique where we had 30,000 dimensional vector. So do you mind maybe clarifying what what would be computationally expensive here? Uh, 
okay, um, there is a little delay in communication. Maybe we can come, come back to that. I will keep an eye on the chat. Alrighty, so uh, let's see how we can do that. Um, actually, before that, let me uh, also remind you of the TF-IDF um, where we had recorded the, the uh, term frequency, which is the count of the term of a token in a given document times inverse document frequency, uh, which is um, N, which is a total number of documents uh, divided by how many times ter term, uh, how many documents the term had occurred in. So if it occurred only in one, we would get uh, N, which is the highest possible weight uh, over here. And we can put this TF IDF um, values in a term document matrix. So in every row, we will have values for each term and in every column for, e for uh, every document. And before I mention this latent semantic indexing model, which basically does the um, SVD decomposition of this term document matrix. And from that SVD decomposition, if you truncate it to, let's say only 300 dimensions, you will again end up with a dense vector of 300 dimensional, uh, 300, with 300 dimensions. So uh, already with that model, which is way older than the techniques we are gonna talk about today, um, we have seen an example of an embedding. So there is a question of the benefit from embedding. Uh, the question is that, uh, excuse me. Um, so the answer is that these dense representations have been shown empirically to work uh, way better than the sparse vectors. So having these vectors that are smaller in size and they have no zeros work better. Um, better in terms of the, you know, let's say accuracy. And there are hypotheses of why this could be the case. Um, it's a, a little bit, I would say, um, hard to confirm this hypothesis knowing today that is extremely over parameterized models like large language models work so well. But one hypothesis um, that is often stated is that if you have 300 dimensional vector, then you need to learn less parameters because your input is a smaller size. And that becomes an easier problem for a machine learning from the machine learning perspective, where the chance of you overfitting on your training data is smaller. Uh, again, now that we know that we have these large language models, I, I'm not hundred hundred percent sure whether that's the you know the right uh, uh, hypothesis. Uh, but there is something about sparsity that machine learning um, kind of uh, doesn't prefer here. Okay, um, uh, and I mean, I, I also want to kind of um, um, revisit the arguments I have said before that with uh, just presence or absence, uh, you you do lose information about whether something is a synonym or uh, or not, uh, right? You know, like these two words would be completely represented completely uh, different. Um, their appearance in the document. Uh, it wouldn't you wouldn't in any way capture that they are synonyms or um, similar or in uh, related uh, to each other. All right, so there is a comment. So in a five word sentence, we would have five vectors representing each word. As far as I understand, we would need to perform some operation on all of those five vectors in order to compute, let's say, sentiment of that sentence. Wouldn't that be more expensive than performing the same computation on a feature of vectors or of presence for the same five word sentence? Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, yeah, I think it wouldn't be more computational expensive because um, maybe we are stepping a little bit ahead now, but um, next time we will learn about, okay, how to build the simplest neural network on top of these uh, things. And if you would continue working with uh, sparse feature vec vectors of dimension uh, 30,000, uh, you would need to then construct a matrix whose uh, dimension, one of the dimensions is 30,000. Whereas if you have 300 dimensional uh, vector in the input, your matrix will need to have only, let's say 300 rows. So uh, yeah, I don't think it's it's uh, more computational intensive because in the end you, 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 know, you just average these vectors. It's not like you concatenate them into uh, five times 300 dimensional uh, vector. Okay, uh, so let's move on. 
Um, I have already pointed up to some um, some uh, differences between uh, possible representations. So we, I, I keep saying short versus long. That means the size of the vectors. Uh, when I say short, we think about like 50 to 100 dimensional instead of the size of the vocabulary or this, you know, number of documents we have in our collection of documents, which would be way higher than a thousand. Um, one thing I didn't mention right now is that with presence or absence or counts, we know exactly the interpretation of each dimension in our vector. We know that that's, if we see one, we know, aha, uh -huh, that work was present uh, in my document. However, with these embeddings, uh, we will have, um, uh, we will have um, non-interpretable dimensions. So when we produce these vectors and you have certain number, you don't really know what that numbers mean anymore. So we definitely lost something with these uh, dense embeddings. Dense again means that we do not have zeros and sparse we means we have lots of zeros. And as I said, empirically, it has been shown that dense work vectors work better, better in every NLP task uh, uh, than sparse vectors. And then uh, we briefly talk about, about static versus contextualized. Um, static means that we have one fixed embedding for each word in the vocabulary. And later on, when we talk about pre-trained language models and uh, BERT, uh, we will talk about contextualized word representations. That means that for every occurrence of this word in every um, sentence that's different from each other, we will have, let's say we have thousand sentences and in each one of these sentences where Bayesian had occurred, we will have thousand different representations of the word uh, Bayesian, which will differ because the this uh, word will appear in these different sentences, therefore its context is gonna be different and therefore we talk about contextualized uh, word representations. Okay, um, so let's move on on uh, word to vec. Oh, there is one question. So why do we just average the vectors rather than weight certain words higher in context? Um, I mean, it's, an, it's a model in choice. Very often averaging works just fine. You can do whatever you want. Um, we don't really like weighting things because then you need to learn weights. So you need have double you know, learning problem. Um, if you would like to set your weights automatically that uh, then, um, yeah, um, you're you're again doing feature feature engineering. So, um, yeah, you want to th keep things simple, and if it works when they are, you know, when things are simple, there is really no uh, reason to to change them. Uh, whether three hundred or fifty or thousand is um, is a hyperparameter. So when people started to, to build these embeddings, that was a choice they had to make. They probably tried different versions, um, you know, different values, and they probably wanted to also keep the balance between having something as small as possible and uh, still, you know, that's that still works well. So word to back that we are going to talk about now came with these dimensions. So you know that that were then uh, you know people stick around uh, with them. But yeah, it's a choice, and you can decide what makes most uh, sense for for your own problem. Okay, so moving on to word vector. Uh, word vector is a software package uh, that includes two algorithms that have been introduced in 2013. Uh, one is skipgram skip with negative sampling, and the other one is continuous bag of words. And you will hear people loosely referring to these algorithms as word to vec. So when someone says word to vec, what they mean is, um, yeah, I use word to vec embeddings that might have been produced with either one of these uh, algorithms. They work, I think, equally fine. But today we are gonna cover uh, skip, skip around with negative sampling. Um, and the intuition behind word to vec is that instead of counting how often each word W occurs near another word, let's say parrot, we will train a classifier on a binary prediction task. And this task will determine is the word W likely to show up near word parrot. Um, and remember this all goes back to that distributional uh, hypothesis. 
we will go into the details, but just to put you in the mindset of what exactly we are going to do here uh, for to do this prediction task. Uh, with skip ram, skip ram, we are going to use the target word and a neighboring context word from some large corpus of data we have. Remember, similar to tokenization, we start with this large collection of data. And um, if we have word uh, and some uh, neighboring context word, these are going to be our positive examples. And we are randomly going to sample other words as, as negative uh, examples. And we are going to train a classifier to distinguish those two cases. So we are going to give it a word and some context word, and the model will need to predict whether they, they indeed appear together in the corpora. And we are defined, going to define some loss, and we are going to know whether they appeared or not, and move, uh, you know, change the weights of our models, our parameters accordingly. And then the learned weights are going to serve as our embeddings. Now, I'm, you know, I know this is pretty vague now because these are just four very broad steps, but now we are going to go you know, into into the details. Um, but you know, quick. Any any issues so far with this idea? Okay, so um, imagine we have this uh, this piece of text that we have extracted from our corpus. Uh, here, our word of interest is W is apricot, and we again need to make a modeling choice of what is our context length gonna be like. Um, uh, how much to the left and to the right of this word, we are going to consider the, the surrounding words to be neighboring. And again, empirically, people have uh, shown that a good number here to take is two. Take two words to the left and two words to the right. Uh, here, for the illustration, we ignore the punctuation. Um, some other people have explored other context values, and the choice matters. What kind of vectors you are going to end up with? Uh, differs. Um, for example, if the longer your context is, you might be able to capture um, longer syntactic dependencies. Then again, um, st sticking with this short, you know, like a shorter um, neighborhood has has other benefits. Okay, and um, as I said, our goal is to predict whether uh, words appear together uh, in the in these local neighborhoods. So we're trying to calculate the probability that the word W and some uh, context word uh, equals to one. Um, so for apricot and tablespoon, apricot and off, apricot and gen, apricot and A, we want to have probability of these two, th of these two words appearing together to be positive. And again, we can use our logistic function, remember, that we have used uh, before for logistic regression. And what we want to also base our whole calculation on is that if the if we produce we want to produce some kind of embedding, some kind of dense vector representations of words, apricot, tablespoon, of gem A, such as that when these their vector similarity is high that their probability here is going to be high too. So basically, some kind of similarity measure here in our logistic function will be included in the place of term z over here. Uh, because then we know if z is high here, uh, then the probability is going to be close to 1. And that's what we want to achieve. So we just need a similarity between uh, these uh, representations of the word w and the potential uh, context word too. And um, a very common way to measure similarity of vectors is to use cosine similarity. That is the angle between two vectors, um, uh, which is defined by this uh, equation where you take the dot product of the vectors and uh, normalize it by the dot pro by the uh, product of their uh, norms. And um, in this way, you just care about the angle you don't care about these lengths, the magnitudes of these individual uh, vectors, which is often not really um, of interest. 
Um, so the cosine similarity of the unit vectors is the same as their dot product. And as I said, uh, with the cosine similarity, we, the, you know, we care about only about the uh, angle. Um, however, in the word to vec, we are going to also care about the magnitude. So we are going to define the uh, similarity as the dot product of these two uh, vectors. So uh, just to, to kind of go over the dot product of vectors intuition, uh, here we have cherry and information being almost orthogonal to each other, meaning they are very different, right? So uh, when we make the dot product of cherry to information, is going to end up somewhere over here. It's going to be almost zero. And then um, if you take the dot product between digital and information, we, we are going to end up somewhere here. Uh, so uh, the dot product is going to be way higher. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's that. It gives us information uh, we need. And we are going to use that for word to work. We are going to define the similarity as the uh, dot product. And in place of our logistic function, in place of Z, we are going to place our similarity, which is the dot product. And then uh, what we get is that probability of these two words appearing together in the context is going to be maximum, almost one, uh, as soon as these two things are, the dot product is, is getting high. And if the dot product is uh, getting really low, then we'll get, um, get um, probability of zero. Okay, uh, does this intuition make sense? All right, I will take the silence as uh, yes, it does, uh, but keep the questions going in the in the chat. What does the plus refer to? Plus refer to uh, the, like we have two options in this binary classification task, positive and negative. Here, positive means that the word W and word C had appeared are do appear together in this uh, small uh, context. And negative means no, these two words do not. Uh, the probability of these two words not appearing together in the context. So appear or not to appear because we are solving this binary classification task is where W likely to show up near Barrett. How does the vector represent word again? Um, yeah, so we are building, we are trying to, we are now building a model to represent the word. So we are like, we are in the process of discovering that. We we don't, I didn't give you an answer to that yet. And uh, the vector we get in the end is gonna be learned. So the numbers in that vectors are gonna be found automatically. Uh, question is, in similarity, W, C, how many dimensions do VSC have? As many dimensions in the word in the vocabulary? So no, not, I mean, you could have that if you define your vector like that. Um, um, but right now we are trying to move away from the vectors that are uh, represented with the presence or absence of the word in the vocabulary. But yes, if you had defined your feature vector to be presence and absence, you could have a dot product as your similarity measure. So dot product is a similarity measure. It's not, um, as you as long as you have vectors, you can use it. It's, it's not constrained to the choice of the uh, feature vector. Is this classifiers for similarity or meaning of the uh, sentence. Um, so uh, we are not measuring right now similarity or meaning of a sentence. We are constrained to to the words, and um, we are trying to build the uh, representation that will capture the meanings of the words that will have you know where the operations over these vectors will be able to give us information of ha huh, are these words similar are they related are there synonyms are there antonyms that's that's what we are at right now but we are not talking about the uh, meaning of a full sentence yet okay so um this is where we stopped we have um defined the the context the context is two words to the left two words to the right uh, we are interested in defining the probability of two words appearing together in a context. And we want the probability of words that indeed had appeared in a context in, in a context in a, our corpus to have a high probability. 
And we have defined how to measure such probability by saying, well, if their um, similarity measured by the dot product of their vectors is very high, then we are going to have probability that's also very really high. Uh, we just need to find representations of C and W. That's what we don't have right now. We are trying to find these representations where the dot product will be high uh, when they are truly similar. So if we had um, canyons and gorges, we would have um, you know really high similarity under learned uh, embeddings. Um, yeah, so again, questions about how to choose things. It's a hyperparameter. You really need to get comfortable that, you know, machine learning is an empirical, uh, very empirical. There are answers so, uh, to what is the best thing, how to find it optimally. There are procedures for finding hyperparameters um, in, a, in, a, you know, in a way that will quicker give you um, optimal hyperparameters, but I really, I really don't want to go into that right now. Okay, so under skip ground classifier, we have, um, this is just a slide, the difference of the equation we had over here. Here we had just individual words. Uh, here we want to have that uh, words and this context, a given word like an apricot and uh, entire context of these four surrounding words. Uh, we wanna give a probability of, of that word appearing that context should be, uh, um, Excuse me, it shouldn't be anything. I'm trying to uh, uh, read this equation. This equation says that what's the probability of the word W, like apricot, appearing in a given context determined by the length L, which was for us before um, two words to the left and to the right. And because we assume that the probability of each one of these words uh, appearing together is independent, which is again, I idea assumption we use in machine learning, which is not necessarily a valid assumption in the real world, but we use it because it makes math possible. Then we can write this uh, probability as the product of individual probabilities. And because we assume a uh, logistic regression under this, we will have a product of these terms over here. And then again, because we like to work with log probabilities rather than uh, with probabilities, we are gonna slap logarithm to all of this. And instead of products, we are gonna have sum of log uh, probabilities. So this is our, our gonna be our uh, skip ground classifier. Still, we didn't learn anything. And now what comes next is how to actually learn these uh, vectors. Okay, so to learn skip ground uh, vectors, uh, we are going to use a set of positive and negative examples an initial set of random embeddings. So you take your corpus, let's say we take all Wikipedia articles and we extract uh, positive and negative pairs. So for each word and left, right window, uh, we will record that these are positive examples, right? Um, like the one we had before. Um, and uh, we can construct negative examples by using a word and then just randomly sample some other words. Um, not totally, like the randomly, yes, but the weight to each other word is given us, is, is slightly modified by their unigram frequency in this corpus, such that words that are more rare are sampled a little bit more. So we'll have that. And then for each one of these words, we are going to have um, uh, for words and context words, we are going to start with randomly initialized vectors. Um, so we select three uh, values of these vectors randomly. And the goal here is to change those weights, those numbers in these random embeddings, such that in the end, you get um, dot products that make sense. The dot products where dot products of these learned vectors are high when words are indeed similar or related. Okay, so um, as I said, the goal is to adjust these embeddings and adjust is the same word to me as learning uh, these uh, embeddings, such that we maximize the similarity of the target word, context word pairs drawn from the positive examples and minimize the similarity from the negative examples. Um, and this is the equation we are gonna use. So here, first, um, remember, 
with uh, about max min and min difference. So we want to maximize the log probability of something we want to happen is the same as saying we want to minimize the negative log probabilities. It's the, it's the same thing. So here, because we want to define loss, because our goal is to eventually use the hasty gradient descent, we are going to work with negative log probabilities. So we, what we want to happen is that uh, we want that the you know uh, that the probability of the um, our w with uh, actual word that appeared in a context uh, to be to to have you know to be high, and uh, we want to have the probability of uh, saying well uh, this word w and some other word that never appeared uh, together with this word w we want to assign it label no these two words do not appear together so these are things we are trying to achieve um is there a question about that I just want to make sure that this first step here is clear Yeah. So yeah, basically just to just to repeat, I, I know maybe it's if you're not you know yet comfortable with it, uh this maximization turning in minimization can be a little bit mind-bending, but what we want to do is maximize the probabilities of these things. And that's the same as saying we want to minimize um the um uh the the log probabilities, negative log probabilities. Okay, hopefully that's clear, but stop me if you're trying to think about this in your head right now and you, you can't get it. Happy to repeat it. And here, these are the just steps of, of um, you know, deriving this a little bit further. Uh, you know, the logarithm of a product equals to the sum of logarithms. That's what we have used over here. And then uh, we have defined what is the probability of assigning that something is um, appearing in the context. We didn't define the probability of them not appearing, but we know because these are probabilities, the probability here, uh, this one is the same as one minus uh, this one over here. And um, here, um, because I did, took a screenshot of these equations from the book, they are using sigma where I have used before f. This is just a logistic function. So uh, this is just a, just a, a equation from before. Okay, uh, there is a question. Um, just to clarify, so we learn classifier for making words from sentence as similar to embedding words as it could. Um, let me see whether I understand that. We learn classifier for making words from sentence as similar to embedding words as it could. Yeah, I can't really follow this. So I'll try to say it a little bit differently. So we are, learning a classifier uh, that based on the vector representations of the word and the context word uh, and words that and some other words that are not in context it's uh, this classifier tries to predict whether this uh, word and a word from a context appeared together or not and it's doing that by uh, using the dot product which is our similarity measure to determine that if the dot product is high then the classifier is going to say yeah these two things are together or not um, we don't have great vectors yet so we start with some crappy vectors and then we adjust them we change them until we achieve this until the classifier can indeed predict that words that have appeared in the context uh, uh, um, it predicts they appeared in the context based on their similarity Okay, uh, then the question, sorry, why do we multiply D with the uh, here? Oh yeah, so uh, we wanna achieve two things here. We wanna achieve that uh, the probability of a W and a word that had appeared in the context, which is our positive examples. We want to uh, uh, maximize the probability of signing positive label here, which means these two things appear together in the context. At the same time, we want to um, uh, say that word, uh, two words that did not appear in the context together, so W and a negative example, um, we want to uh, be able to say, no, these two things are 
different from each other and, and they do not appear in context together. So we want to be able to have embeddings where we both capture similarities and uh, dissimilarities. So uh, here, why do we have product in the end? Is um, basically we assume that um, each one of these things had appeared independently of each other. And then that enables us to write uh, the likelihood of all of that happening as a product of these individual uh, probabilities. Another question to compute uh, the negative label, how do we choose C negative? Words do not appear. Are those words chosen based on the entire corpus or we choose some fixed number of words, say top 10, uh, which are not neighbors? Yeah, this is a great question. The choice of um, negative examples is actually uh, not done just by picking any words randomly. Um, it's done by first counting how many uh, times each word uh, appears in the corpus. And then uh, we randomly sample, but we uh, give give weights, uh, give more higher probabilities of being selected to words that have lower counts, meaning more rare words. Um, because when you think about it, if a word is a little bit more rare, it's likely to appear uh, less with other words uh, that we have in our vocabulary. So that's the only thing we do, but we don't take, we just stop 10 unrelated words. Uh, we we use the entire uh, vocabulary we have, as far as I know. Um, and yeah, um, it's just, as, as here we have another hyperparameter, which is K, how many of these um, negative samples we use. I don't remember uh, exact number, but it's important that you have here have um, more, more negative examples than positive examples. And I don't ex know exactly what was the, the reason behind this decision. I know it's important. I don't know whether people have found it just empirically. They tried K equals one and K equals something more. And then they found that one value for K is way better than the others. Uh, I really don't know, but I do know that you need to have K that's higher than one to, for this to work well. Okay. Uh, uh, see, why does loss have to be negative of their sum? Um, I, so I don't I don't really understand the, why the sum is here important. So I will rephrase this question. Um, is the question, why are we taking the negative log probabilities instead of just uh, positive? And the reason is, uh, if that's truly the question, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, when we are defining the loss, we want to minimize the loss. We want to find the values where the loss is going to go down. And uh, we actually want to maximize these probabilities. So to turn maximization problems into minimization, we just uh, re, you know, change the sign. So instead of having maximized probability, we have minimized negative probabilities. And these are the exact same, um, exactly the same optimization problem. You will find uh, the same values that minimize or maximize these, but we uh, need minimization because very often we are going to use stochastic gradient descent and then we are using it to mi minimize things, not to maximize. Okay, uh, there is a question of why there are multiple uh, C negatives. I, I, I spend a, a quite a few minutes to go over this, so um, it's, it's important. We don't know exactly, I personally don't know exactly why. Um, it might be uh, the case that people just reported it empirically that they try multiple values and they found that uh, having uh, more negatives is important. I, I don't remember the exact intuition, but it is it is important. And then how do we choose W and C? Again, that's what we are trying to trying to do. Like uh, again, the goal is to adjust these embeddings. So we start with random values for W and C, and then we are going to iteratively change the values such that we minimize this loss. So I think that's my next slide. Actually, uh, we are going to use our favorite, I hope again, uh, algorithm for minimizations of functions, our loss functions, stochastic gradient descent. Which means we start with the random values for W and C. And in our first iteration, we are going to calculate some loss over here. And that loss in the beginning is going to be pretty high. So we are going to change the values of W and C such that, um, excuse me, such that we minimize this loss. 
Um, I want to warn you guys something. Uh, previously, we used W to sign weights, and all all the W here are also you know weights we are trying to learn. Um, they also have another representation, which uh, another interpretation we didn't have before with logistic regression and percepts. On here, these are going to be the representations of words. So, do not try to think about these Ws as exact Ws we have seen in previous lectures. Rather, think about those Ws we had before to be these thetas over here, um, which include more than just W. Uh, and, and yeah. Um, the yeah the interpretation is is not the same okay so uh we had very high loss what happens next well we uh we uh we are tweaking our uh, values of our w's and our vector c's such that we move apricot and jam closer increasing their uh, dot product and we move apricot and let's say matrix uh, away from each other by decreasing the uh, the dot product. So this is what's basically happening when we are minimizing this loss. We are kind of we start imagine a, imagine we are working with two D points. You start with some random assignments of these uh, vectors, and then you are just kind of changing where uh, these um, uh, points are appearing. Uh, such that you get uh, these uh, dot products that make sense, where you know you will have a high dot products which for vectors that are closed and uh, and not otherwise. Okay, when we choose a neighborhood for two words before and after as a context of word W, that would mean we have uh, four positive examples. Then why does LC have only one C positive uh, examples? Um, yeah, you, th you think about each one of these positive example as a separate positive examples. Uh, so here you would have, um, let me see the example. Here, you, for example, we have apricot tablespoon. Uh, indeed, all of these are positive examples. You're just using them independently. You are not using them together in the, uh, as, a, as a single example. And that's the choice that these people have decided on when they developed this model and it works well. Okay. Um, yeah, so when we use stochastic gradient descent, uh, remember we need the uh, gradients of the loss with respect to the weights. Uh, and we have here, uh, our weights here are the, basically the weights for the uh, words that, um, that uh, words W for positive and negative examples. And in the end, you are going to end up with all these um, vectors, uh, but one word such as zebra might be used both as a W and both as a positive example, right? So what do you choose in the end, right? Um, and there are, uh, you know, many things people do here. Sometimes they uh, sum the vectors of let's say here, the vector of the zebra in W vectors and the uh, vector of zebra in the uh, C positive uh, vectors. Uh, very often people just ditch these uh, context vectors and uh, they stick with the W vectors. So again, it's a choice, yet another modeling choice. Machine learning is all about making decisions. Uh, so you'll see this quite a lot if you haven't um, you know, seen it before. Um, so yeah, um, I recommend thinking about ditching these and just leaving uh, all of these as your final uh, embeddings. Okay, so that brings us to the end. That's how we get these uh, embeddings. So it's for me now very important that uh, you you get um, that you get what we have done here. So I'm gonna stop for a second and see whether there are any questions. Okay, so assume I'm assuming that's um, that's um, that's the case. Um, I want to emphasize that there are many other static embeddings, and for you, maybe the most important one is a uh, fast text. Um, remember last time I have made a huge fuss about how that we don't like to work with words, individual words. Uh, we like subwords, and now we ended up producing vectors for each one of these words. 
which is very, um, you know, now disappointing, like, uh, right, uh, now we are stuck again with our problems of unknown words and so on. Um, so in 2017, uh, there has been a, a proposed an extension of word to vec where you can make a distinct vector representation, uh, excuse me, where you can take into account this subword information and then um, Basically, you tweak uh, skip gram algorithm such that you work with subwords uh, rather than individual word. Uh, Fastex uh, library is very commonly used. I check it out. Uh, I recommend checking it out to see, you know, if you would now take um, um, a large corpus, you can yourself derive uh, these uh, vectors for your problem, which is a common Thing people will do because the choice of corpus you have in the beginning matters quite a lot, right? Um, so, for example, if you want to use word to vec for a domain that's very, very different from the original corpus, which um, I don't remember what exactly it was. It was producing while everyone was in Google, if they're not uh, anymore. And I think it might be one of the like news, Google News Corpora or something like that. So if you try to use it on some like medical uh, stuff, uh, it might not work very well, but you might have a corpus of your medical text and you can derive these vectors yourself. Um, in, at a similar time that uh, Word2Vec has released, uh, Glove embeddings had been released as well. Uh, and people have used uh, these two uh, embedding types quite interchangeably. Um, and then after 2014, uh, a lot of NLP was, oh, let me try these different embeddings and uh, let me plug it into a small neural network and see whether I'll get better results. So by the time I started my PhD, that was, you know, really all the rage. Uh, we had so many different embeddings. Uh, and uh, now the all these choices aren't so important anymore because, uh, as I said, we are going to use uh, learn about contextualized word embeddings and then improved all, all, over all of this. But then again, if you don't have a very complex and uh, task that uh, requires a lot of reasoning, I think um, using these kinds of embeddings with a very simpler model, like logistic regression, might be a very, very good choice for your, let's say, classification task. OK, so there are a few more things I want to talk about. Uh, what you're going to see uh, very often is these kinds of visualizations um, where you take your embeddings that you have learned and then you project them to a two-dimensional space. There are many techniques for dimensionality reduction. Uh, and many, very often in this space, we use TSNI. Um, I want to warn you that all of these uh, visualization techniques really depends on the you know ability of the visualization technique to project high dimensional space into two dimensions, uh, and there are a lot of you know drawbacks to that. I recommend reading this blog post, um, which has these really really nice uh, visualizations that shows um, it kind of demonstrates to you how. Um, hyperparameters of these visualization techniques matter. And here for the original data set, depending on which hyperparameters they choose, they get widely different uh, uh, clusters. So, you know, uh, you might found one of these that's very nice, uh, or maybe you have found something like this, which is not very nice. And then you might be representing uh, uh, what, what is truly going on. Um, under in this in this problem, uh, but yeah, you'll see these visualizations uh, quite often. Let me try to go back to this full screen mode. And uh, if you have these visualizations, if they are done properly, you might find uh, something that makes sense. So here, um, uh, dislike, bad, worst, worse are all close to each other, which makes sense because they are all negative uh, words, right? And in this paper, they have shown how you can produce visualizations of phrases from these word embeddings, which I don't want to go into. It's not, uh, you know, uh, you, again, you can, for example, average them and see whether they are going to end up uh, somewhere close. And similarly here, you have amazing traffic, nice, good, uh, all appearing close to each other. So you find these regions of semantically um, a similar examples, which is what we really wanted, right? Um, 
And uh, very often also people will say, well, if I have a word dislike, I'm going to show the top K uh, nearest neighbors. And here, if we had nearest neighbors being four, we would have, you know, let's say three bad worst words. And we will say, yeah, that makes sense. Like these words being nearest neighbors of word dislike makes, uh, makes sense. Um, yeah, I didn't mention it anywhere in the slides, but uh, when people go about evaluating the embeddings they produce, um, for certain languages, there are human annotations of similarity of two words. Um, so, you know, I mentioned before many cases such as belief and impression would have high similarity or skiing or snowboarding would also have maybe high similarity, but then hot and cold would have like whatever is the negative uh, similarity. And what you can do here is take the some kind of uh, similarity measure, such as cosine similarity, and then measure the correlation between the uh, cosine similarity you get for your vectors and human judgments of similarity of these words. And what you should find if you had produced high quality vectors is high quality embeddings is a uh, high correlation then. Okay. Uh, you might have seen a ton of these things, uh, uh, these analogies or relational similarity. Uh, it has been shown that embeddings can capture some relational uh, meanings uh, for some relations. And later on, it has been shown that maybe, maybe that's possible only for a certain set of uh, relations, not uh, many. Um, but this problem has turned into these analogy problems. So answering A is to B as A star is to what? which is very often written uh, in this form. So for example, apple to tree is same as grape to, and then the answer should be wine or king to, uh, king to man, excuse me, not main, uh, is same as woman is to queen. Uh, Paris to France is same as uh, Italy is to uh, Rome. Um, and what has been shown is that you can find, you know, this question marks here, you can computationally find by using this uh, word to vec embeddings we have uh, talked about. So you, you to, for example, uh, for, uh, for apple to trees uh, is a great, if, um, anyway, um, uh, to, to get the answer here, we need to add the vector from the word apple, the vector go that goes from apple to tree. So this vector over here, which we get by subtracting the vector from um, tree from the vector of apple. So this vector here equals to vector of tree subtracted by vector of apple. And you add that vector here, you add it to the vector of grape. And then you check, you ended up here and you check, okay, what is my nearest neighbor here in my word to vec vector space? And then you find that the the nearest uh, neighbor corresponds to word wine, and you predict that wine is what's uh, what should be the question mark here. What I just said is is written by this equation. And yeah, as I said, people have shown that you can do all sorts of uh, analogies to to determine. You know, you you can solve all sorts of analogies by using these word to vec um, operations, vector operations. Uh, but again, again, later on, it has also been shown that there are many problems with this, including that only certain relations that have been so many times shown in these presentations can be captured by this. But then there are so many relations that cannot, and there, those are very often, uh, you know, not included in people's uh, presentations. And then a very important topic as well, and I hope uh, by the end of this class, I, I left like a session or two for responsible AI, we can talk more about these definitions and you know, um, it becomes even more important with large language models. Uh, but these kinds of analogies have been also used to show that uh, these um, Word2Vec and other embedding models also capture societal biases such as gender bias. So. Uh, if you do this kind of uh, analogy with computer programmer and men, then you will find that uh, if what computer programmer is the main homemaker is for the woman, kind of uh, reinforcing that uh, women do these, um, you know, stereotypical jobs of uh, being housewives. Or um, if a doctor is a man, what nurse is to a woman where there is um, doctor would be appropriate answer for a woman here as well. 
So the downstream impact of this is that if you're building tools uh, uh, atop of these word embeddings, which people are doing, and imagine building a tool that decides whether you are going to hire a doctor or a programmer, uh, then your algorithm is going to downweight the uh, uh, applications of uh, women for these, uh, you know, uh, roles. Uh, because it won't deem that, you know, if it sees women's name, it will think, okay, this, uh, this is not something I have associated with this role. So this is not important for this role. And the consequence is this is something called allocation harm. We are building the system uh, for allocating resources such as jobs or credits, and uh, we allocate uh, who gets jobs or credits unfairly uh, to different groups. And, you know, common I think people will say, well, we just learned this from data and the world is biased, which is, which is of course true. But the issue is also that these algorithms are amplifying these biases. So whatever these metrics are for uh, how you know um, gender these things are, they become even more gendered uh, in these uh, embedding spaces that were in their input uh, statistics. So if uh, let's say um, uh, women had appeared uh, twice more uh, with the word nurse than a doctor in a in a original corpus in this embedding space, uh, their similarity won't be as twice uh, higher. It's going to be like 20 times higher or something. And also there is this uh, important term uh, important uh, term representational harm that's harm caused by system demeaning or even ignoring some social groups. This is kind of related to the allocation harm as well. Uh, and here, uh, an example that's been reported in uh, in uh, in the past that names like Leroy, which are common, more commonly given to uh, African American uh, people than uh, maybe someone in Europe, they have a higher glove cosine similarity with um, some uh, set of unpleasant words, uh, while names like Brad or Greg or Courtney have a higher cosine with uh, pl uh, pleasant words. So the way we represent certain uh, demographics is. Uh, is demeaning, uh, and uh, in, in some instances, these these groups might be even uh, ignored. So yeah, this, this there are a lot of issues when we once we turn everything in these dense representations that are not interpretable anymore. Um, yeah, I see there is a question by Brandy. Uh, Brandy, do you want to speak up? Or you yeah, I think yeah, I think okay. that you um were kind of like seeing it at the end there is that because we turn them into dense representations, um, well, while these algorithms are being trained, um, are they not able to determine, you know, that they're analyzing like a name? Because like, why would we include names? Why would we include gender into these algorithms in the first place? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you care about this design and if you care about these biases, you might be aware that algorithms and might, you know, no, they might do this. So let's uh, remove the names and uh, in any kind of information that might be um, indicative of the gender of the person or whatever common gender uh, we might associate with the name. And um, so there are two issues at play here. I think people... Uh, maybe they are aware more about this now, but when these techniques have been released in 2014, they were pretty new. So if people didn't know about these biases, they might not have the, um, you know, um, it might not have occurred to them that they should not even like in a CV that should strip off the name because that might be indicative of the gender and the model might be uh, exploiting this gender bias. Uh, the other issue is that um, I think the people weren't uh, aware that just by the name, the model might um, induce uh, or try to guess what the gender of this person is, which was not the case before, right? Like we, once we turn everything in these uh, very dense vectors, these abilities to capture something that was not explicitly given in the input and the models implicitly using that information become possible. So yeah, I wouldn't blame you know people for necessarily making bad choices. Maybe they made choices that were not informed very, very well, but um, yeah, today today we'll know way more. And uh, I, I, I think many of these things are still unfortunately happening. Just maybe two or three years ago, Amazon had a huge case where they tried to build one of these tools from the CVs and uh, very quickly it became very 
uh, biased and they had to shut it down. Yeah, so hopefully that answers your question. It does. Um, I was just gonna, you know, kind of add to that. Um, so is it hard to retrain the models? Like it would take like way, like way too long to retrain the models to get rid of these biases or? Yeah, that's what, a what's the good question. Yeah, I didn't mention it here. There is a line of work called debiasing and it's incredibly hard. So there are proposals that people gave, but really, really, really removing any kind of identity-based information um, uh, is uh, with, with very strong guarantees, it's very hard because models are able to capture these spurious correlations from the data. So just as an example, um, there has been this uh, paper that has shown that even if you if you remove the person, like if you like pixels where a person occurs, you replace them with black pixels. So the, you know, the person is masked. Um, the model is still able to predict the gender of the person just because in these images on the internet, for example, women are in many images represented with like salads and babies in the background. So just by seeing some cues in the background, the model still can you know, uh, induce the, what was the gender of the person that uh, had actually appeared. So it's a very, very difficult and still very open research uh, question. If you, if you have, if you want any references about this, uh, let me know, I'm happy to share. Thank you. Okay, so we are at time. Thank you so much, everyone. I, hopefully I feel better by Wednesday and we'll see each other uh, in uh, in person. Right, see ya.